So my talk is about this chemical transfer method that we recently developed, very much a work in progress. Um, I'm at Brooklyn College at CUNY, um, and uh, I'll try to keep it short. Again, if uh, the window is not visible or anything like that, please let me know. Okay, so um, I wanted to start uh, delineating what uh, this method gives uh, uh, relative to other methods. Um, first of all, it's a, a chemical method based on a, a thermodynamic perturbation that's actually a coordinate displacement perturbation. I'll try to explain what that means. Um, it supports both absolute and relative binding free energy calculations, including scaffold hopping transformation. Uh, it uses a single solvent box. Uh, there's no intermediates, no dummy atoms. Uh, you can use uh, your favorite setup uh, tools to set up the system as you usually do. It, uh, it does not require soft core pair potentials. It does not require Van der Waals retrostatic splitting, which are customary. Uh, in fact, it doesn't require any modification of the energy and forces routines. In fact, it's force field agnostic. It's applicable to any force field. It's also a fully academic uh, enterprise. So there's a plugin for OpenMM, open source. Um, so, uh, you know, th these are uh, major claims. Um, I'll try to explain what we mean and what the limitations are. Of course, there are limitations uh, as uh, everything does. Before time goes, in fact, I should start my um, goes away from me. I would, uh, I want to acknowledge the people who actually did the work in the past few months, which are uh, the graduate students in uh, in the lab at Brooklyn College, Shinam, uh, Solmas, and Joe, Solmas, uh, Shinam Kutten, Solmas, Azimi, and Joe Wu. Again, they did uh, pretty much all the work that I'll be, are going to be presenting. I also want to acknowledge uh, the uh, Rajat Pal at Silicon. A lot of the work uh, builds on his PhD work. Want to mention the uh, collaborators uh, at CUNY, uh, uh, Lauren Wickstrom, Tom Kurtzman, and Nanji Deng at PACE, uh, the, our local New York downtown uh, group. Also mentioned Ro Levy uh, in his lab at Radgers uh, about 10 years ago, the first uh, baby steps were taken towards uh, the results I'm gonna tell you about. And also knowledge Peter Eastman helped a lot, a lot, uh, helped us a lot implementing um, uh, the software that we're using in OpenMM. And uh, of course, this has been, uh, it's not ideas they came out in a vacuum. Um, there were a lot of works, conversation I had with people uh, over the years uh, that uh, shaped their thinking. Uh, in terms of software, this is we're working now with OpenMM. Uh, we use Schrodinger tools and Amber tools to set up our systems, like uh, I guess many do. Okay, so I will try to explain um, the approach. First of all, is based on uh, the general idea of uh, an alchemical transformation that changes a potential function in this notation. It connects the potential function uh, related to the balance state to that of the unbound state through an alchemical potential. Uh, uh, I think everyone is uh, familiar with this. What um, it's, uh, I wouldn't say different, they're just uh, not the same as uh, free energy perturbation or TI, is that instead of the, the parameter, in, the, the interpolation, the alchemical interpolation being done by parameter interpolation, that is by modifying parameters in the in the potential energy function with dummy atoms or for, or soft core pair potentials, the transformation is done by energy interpolation. And this is nomenclature I've uh, borrowed from uh, uh, papers by uh, Serena Rieniker, which I, I think uh, I don't know where the this nomenclature comes from, but uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, ATM uses energy interpolation, so the lambda dependence. In a sense, it's outside the energy routines. And therefore, that's why the energy routines um, don't need to be um, messed around with. Um, you uh, basically implement this 
outside the energy routines. That makes uh, the method work with any potential energy function, including polarizable, quantum mechanical, uh, machine learning potential, implicit solvent. Um, the downside is it requires, in this case, two potential energy evaluations. I should also say that in this uh, schematics, I've, I'm suggesting a linear interpolation. Uh, it doesn't have to be linear. In fact, it rarely is. But this was just a simple way to represent represent the energy interpolation idea as opposed to parameter interpolation. Okay, so the perturbation that uh, relates the reference potential of the bound state so in this notation u0 to the perturbed uh, potential function is a uh, coordinate displacement of, of the ligand in this case. So we construct the, uh, and this is the core idea of the method, we construct the perturbed uh, potential energy function by displacing the ligand by a constant fixed displacement uh, vector. And uh, this is done at every MD step in order to evaluate the alchemical potential in French. I was trying to make a video to explain <laughs> the, uh, the idea that uh, this displacement occurs at every MD step. Um, the, energy, the reference and perturbed potential energy functions are evaluated at every MD step in order to be uh, later merged together with the forces to go to the next MD step. Um, so this, uh, this idea is, is, is a couple of papers that uh, um, try to develop and uh, explain this, this approach. So of course, the um, uh, benefit of this is that uh, it's, it's a straightforward way to do perturbations. Uh, changing coordinates is probably the easiest thing you can do in a molecular dynamics code. Um, coordinate velocities are, uh, are probably the ones that uh, can be more easily changed and that's why um, this methodology is uh, streamlined the way it is. Um, this idea of a uh, displacement as a perturbation um, can be uh, fully uh, proven mathematically using statistical mechanics. In that case, it takes the form of a change of variable. Uh, of course, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, there's a very rigorous uh, proof that this is a, a valid thing to do. Um, Okay, um, so um, the first test we've done of this method was on the sample six sampling benchmark set. This is a great benchmark set, set up by Ritz et al, uh, Gilson, Schertz, and Codera, and uh, all the names are there. Um, uh, Zoe Kurnia is there. Um, and uh, so basically in, in this benchmark set, uh, you're given everything, you're given the system are set up with the force field assignments, ions, water, everything is there. So you just run it with your software and check whether um, you reproduce the uh, uh, the reference uh, literature values. And uh, without going into many details, the uh, the test was successful and we recently published. So that gave us a lot of confidence that the, the method was working. We then more recently uh, validated the method on a, a, a blinded challenge uh, set, sample eight uh, G DCC um, set. Of course, we didn't know, the, the, the game here was to reproduce the experiments. Uh, we didn't know the experiment while we were doing the calculations, obviously, and we did very well. Um, we had the 79% uh, correlation coefficient uh, which gave us second place, second only to um, the magical J ponder with amoeba. Um, we only we use um, um, a simpler potential uh, gaff, uh, and so it's not a bad place to be. So that gave us uh, additional confidence that the method was working uh, in an unbiased way. There are lots of D tails that I'm skipping over that makes this uh, displacement perturbation actually work. If you just um, deploy it as is, uh, it would not converge. Uh, so there are several tricks um, 
that we do. First of all, there is a version of Softcore um, that uh, deals with the endpoint singularities. Um, the, without going into many details, uh, uh, encourage to read the paper so I can try to uh, uh, answer questions. Um, the Softcore uh, that means the function that addresses the single the uh, singularity endpoint singularities is built into the alchemical function. And this is an idea that uh, it's not unique to this method. Um, this uh, approach, um, which is based on capping the largest perturbation energy one can accept, uh, first of all, is rigorous, um, can be shown uh, mathematically, also uh, leads to this uh, non-needing splitting the Van der Waals and electrostatic uh, steps. So we don't need to decouple uh, uh, charges uh, differently from Lena Jones or other, or other terms. Um, there is an intermediate. Uh, um, it turns out that we cannot go directly from the bound state to the unbound state. We, um, we have a thermodynamic cycles that connects the bound and the unbound state to a common alchemical intermediate which is this funny state in which the ligand is interacting 50% strength in the binding site and in the water bulk. Uh, and then uh, the binding free energy is, uh, the absolute binding free energy is obtained by taking the difference of those two free energy changes to go to this alchemical intermediate. Again, I, I don't have a lot of time to explain it in details, but there is, a, um, just like in double decoupling, there is an intermediate, uh, alchemical intermediate, that the important point is that the alchemical intermediate is not the vacuum state. Um, and I think that uh, is, is a benefit of, of this approach. Also for uh, difficult uh, transformations involving, for example, large ligands, a, um, we deployed this uh, nonlinear um, alchemical function. We use, uh, it's called soft plus function um, using machine learning. Um, and uh, this is coupled to a theory of, of chemical binding that we've developed um, and was the major um, result of uh, Rajat uh, Powell PhD thesis. Uh, we developed a graphical construction schematically shown here that let us um, optimize the parameters of the alchemical function. The idea is to uh, remove uh, gaps in binding energy distribution and perturbation energy distributions. Anyway, so these are technical details that we've had to solve in order to make this thing work. Um, but uh, for the most part, they're now solved and I wish I had more time to um, discuss them. Uh, now, I really want to switch now to uh, the relative binding free energy protocol that stems from the absolute binding free energy protocol that I just discussed. In this case, the reference, in this case, uh, actually it's very similar. Um, the difference, the main distinction, of course, that there are two ligands. One in the uh, reference potential, so the reference state, one ligand is in the binding site and the other ligand sits in the water bulk in the same solvent box. And uh, here too, the perturbed energy potential function is obtained by a translation, but now it's a coupled translation of one ligand out of the binding site and the second ligand go into the binding site, which is mathematically shown here. Uh, so again, it's a translation, it's a generalized translation in which different atom moves in different way. In such a way that the two ligands swap places. Otherwise, the methodology is identical to the absolute binding free energy. The only difference is this idea of, a, of a switching, switching places. So we've um, again used the sample eight uh, benchmark to benchmark the relative binding free energy calculations. Uh, we had five guests for two hosts and for each host we try every possible um, transformation from one ligand to another. 
notice that these ligands uh, do not share a common core for the most part. So most of this uh, transformation, I guess, will be uh, defined as scaffold hopping. And uh, we validated the relative binding free energy calculations two ways. The first is by uh, against the absolute binding free energy calculation that we uh, obtained earlier, the values that we obtained earlier. Um, and we had uh, good agreement within statistical uncertainty. Uh, and also uh, cycle closure error, which is the standard way to test the uh, self-consistency of relative binding energy calculation. Here, we just consider all triangles in a sense. Uh, we have a cycle closure error of only a quarter of a kilocalories per mole. Now, this is possible because, um, so, so in this, um, you can call this methodology as a dual topology. So we don't really have atom mapping in the way that uh, free energy perturbation and thermodynamic integration would have. But what we do to um, enhance convergence is to make sure that the uh, two ligands uh, remain aligned. Now, they always sit uh, in different places, but if they are translated to the same spot, for example, in the binding site, that's what you would see. Uh, we yet, uh, use a restraining potential based on a uh, coordinate system fixed on each ligand defined by uh, three uh, reference atoms. And so we can then make sure that uh, the important uh, functional groups stay near each other, uh, even though the two ligands do not share the same scaffold. Uh, so this was very helpful uh, in order to uh, obtain uh, converged relative binding free energy values. And now it's stuck. Proven from statistical mechanics. Technical problem. Oh yeah, it starts again. Interesting. Okay, um, and here too we've uh, we have uh, in, in this particular system estrogen receptor alpha, we've um, uh, the, the set as four uh, uh, ligands, and they do include scaffold hopping transformation. For example, some transformation involves a change from a five member ring to a six member ring, and uh, uh, the uh, ligands were aligned using the reference frame. Um, and uh, again, we calculated all uh, pairwise relative binding free energy calculations. And here too, we find very good con consistency uh, by cycle closure error, but also with uh, in, in, in terms of the literature values of the relative binding free energy values, um, even though the force field is not uh, not the same, but uh, there is good consistency there. Um, and just uh, this morning, uh, I was able to also calculate, no, it was yesterday actually, um, a relative binding free energy calculation for an, uh, another uh, protein complex that is in the benchmark set, it's the H2. This is a larger ligand, uh, trans uh, and uh, transformation involves breakage of a um, of a five diazo membering. And here too, seems to be working. Um, so I wanna leave you with just the two videos to try to illustrate what the calculation is about. Um, so as I said, the calculation is set up with one ligand uh, in the receptor side, the other ligand is in the water bulk. Of course, in during the chemical transformation, during molecular dynamics, they continuously switch places. Uh, in order to evaluate the alchemical potential in function. But uh, if you were to play a trajectory, that's what you would see. Uh, and of course, the ligand that, uh, depending on what lambda is during the trajectory, um, because lambda is changing dynamically because of the replica exchange uh, algorithm that we used, um, the ligand that's in the bulk has more freedom than the uh, ligand that's in the binding site. Uh, but they remain approximately aligned. And that can be more easily seen 
when they are aligned in the same place. Uh, for example, in the binary site. And you can see how uh, the two ligands, while the different topology, um, they uh, remain aligned. Um, now, during uh, this, represent this representation tries to emphasize the fact that uh, the receptor binding site sees both ligands at the same time, uh, but uh, interacts with each uh, ligand with different strength. In the alchemical intermediate, it interacts uh, uh, with 50% strength with one ligand, 50% strength with the other. The same occurs in the uh, bulk water. So it's, it's kind of a strange uh, um, physical system, but after all, it's alchemical, but uh, it's supposed to be strange, um, I think. OK. Um, all right, so to conclude, I've, uh, I think I've presented to you this new method, to, uh, however briefly, I couldn't go into the, uh, all of the details, but uh, as I mentioned, is uh, applicable to absolute and relative binding free energy calculation. It uses a standard uh, solvent box uh, without uh, any special considerations. Uh, so it's easy to set up, similar to a potential mean force uh, physical pathway method, but it's a chemical. Uh, there is an open source uh, plugin for OpenMM. Uh, looking forward to try to implement this on other MD engines as uh, um, opportunities arise. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's all I have. I'll be happy to take questions. Great, Emilio. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, and I'll dive right into the questions. We have one from Zoe. Hi, Emilio, great talk. Um, how are long range interactions treated? Yeah, so in this calculation, we use practical mesh yield. Um, as I said, the, the uh, method itself does not, uh, uh, it's not different uh, if it had been some other underlying force field being used. But in the, the, the yeah. calculation I've talked about is practical mesh yield. Yes, uh, I think that was relating also to a question that's also in the Q and A. So we're seeing here that uh, the the, um, the molecule is at the edge of the box. So mm -hmm. how would that be treated then with a, you know, with the replicas of the simulation with the periodic boundary conditions? Yeah. So in uh, periodic boundary condition vision of this, uh, you will have uh, infinite number of boxes with the if you want the receptor uh, in this, at the center of each cell and the ligand uh, when it sits in the bulk is at the most distant position is at the vertices of these cells. Um, we do that, it doesn't have to be, but uh, when we do that is to make sure that the ligand in the bulk is as far as possible from any of the copies of the- uh, That it won't exit and re-enter. That's actually the question. Well, it's a three-dimensional periodic system, so there is no entering and uh, exiting. There's no outside. I'm not sure how. Um, but uh, th this is not different from a standard uh, molecular dynamic simulation with periodic binding condition and minimum image convention. Uh, when the, and when the charge changes? Well, there is no charge change because the... Uh, for example, in relative binding free energy calculations, the two ligands sits in the same box at the same time. So the, uh, it's only the coordinates that change during the perturbation, not the charges. So there's okay. no way that the charge of the system could change. Okay, great, thanks. Um, then we have a question from Julie Michelle. Um, Hi, Emilio. Would the relative binding free energy alignment restraint algorithm work as well for floppy? slash rigid ligand pairs? Well, that's a good question. And uh, the answer is the algorithm will work. <laughs> How um, helpful would it be to enhance convergence? Uh, uh, it depends on how different the two ligands are and how floppy they are. Um, uh, the, the statistical thermodynamics tells us that we can only restrain with this method uh, Three, uh, six degrees of freedom of the two ligands. Um, and so any other rotation, internal rotation that's going on 
uh, it happens with whatever time scale it happens. And so if, if there is a hinder internal rotation, that will also hinder convergence. Um, so it, when two ligands are very different from each other, um, the alignment uh, idea would not be able to uh, completely solve the problem. And it might be just better to, in those cases, to do two absolute binding free energy calculation, take the difference. So that's not different from what you would expect with the conventional methods. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, in the interest of time, could I just ask you to maybe look at the QA questions and type answers in there? So I'm aware that we're kind of eating up yeah. break time already, and I think we probably all deserve a small break from the screen. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for such a great talk, um, doing the weird clapping thing again. Um, and a wonderful first session. Thanks to all the speakers and see you back here in 15 minutes.